Welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The world grapples with regional troubles that have spilled over to global challenges, from the ongoing Russian-Ukraine conflict and the Gaza crisis to the sluggish global economic recovery and pressing climate challenges. The issues are complex and interconnected. Calls for decoupling and supply chain disruptions are bearing down on international cooperation. Amid these complexities, where is China and how well is China communicating its goals and thoughts with others as an important stakeholder of the current international order? Recently, I moderated two panels on these topics at a symposium held in Beijing. China and the World Cooperation, Challenges and Shared Prosperity, hosted by the New Era International Communication Research Institute, a joint effort of China Media Group and Renmin University of China. Here are some excerpts of the discussion analyzing the general trends of the dramatically changing world today, which is called 2024, The World We Face. The panel guests are Grzegorz Kolodko, the former Polish Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance, Li Xiangyang, the Director of the National Institute of International Strategy of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Ni Fang, the Director of the Institute of American Studies of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and Zumart Otorbeyev, former Kyrgyz Prime Minister. We are facing so many challenges today. If you think about it, there is major conflicts. There is economic problems and trade barriers and even trade wars. There is great development of technology such as AI. And there is climate change, a common challenge for all of us. Well, at the same time, we are facing aging societies in some part of the world. And the list goes on. From which angle? are you looking at the world today? Which issue might be the challenge you're watching and yet might also be where the solution? Mr. Prime Minister. Recently, a famous Australian think tank made analysis and uh, listed 43 the most advanced technologies these days. And they stated that out of 43, China is number one in 37. Only six left. My statement is that it's competition which brought China to the current stage. And everybody should look to this example as to be how to be successful in the future world. To compete, to compete, to be competitive, especially in high technology and modernization area. We are the countries of uh, Central Asia of high educated population. We want to join China in the uh, 21st century high technologies. In my definition, sanction is recognition of defeat. Defeat of those who are introducing sanctions. It's just simple like that. We spoke about more competition. Now I wanted to say a few words about cooperation. So I continuously, while talking about Belt and Road Initiative, uh, continuing saying that China is achieving almost 20% of world GDP, which means that 80% of world GDP somewhere else. So China would go to outside world to work with other countries. Belt and Road Initiative is signal go out and invite back. Let's go to Mr. Lee. The development of artificial intelligence has added digital and information elements beyond the traditional flow of goods, services, capital, technology, and labor. Simultaneously, we see that AI technology makes communication between human beings more convenient, with language gradually being translated by machines. From a technological perspective, the world should be unified. However, we also see that globalization has entered a phase of periodic readjustment, where the leaders of international rules, especially some rules set by Western countries, are beginning to create various obstacles. The development of technology and regulations are in contradiction.
Mountain. Mr. Deputy Premier. We have two kinds, two types, two approaches to globalization. One is extractive, just to take globalization as another instrument of getting uh, advantage on other countries, other businesses, other regions of the world. And then we have what you call in China win-win, that is inclusive globalization. So from this perspective, the world is on the wrong track. I'm using the term Second Cold War already since a certain period of time. And the site of the trade war, which was not started by China, but basically by the United States, which is not able to stand the growing competition of China industries, especially high-tech industries, which we see recently. After the coupling, we heard about the risking, and now we are getting the new message that there is overcapacity. But overcapacity from American or European or Japanese perspective means actually lack of competitiveness. The American economy is not able to compete with China's technology, China's management, China's manufacturing, other sectors of the economy, and therefore they are using the means of protectionism, which is against the mainstream of irreversible globalization. Mr. Ni. Nee. Different countries have varied understandings of competition. However, I believe that these varying interpretations are not crucial. What may be more significant is the attitude we approach to competition. I believe the best form of competition is with a positive mindset. Currently, the world is facing numerous issues, and each country has its own problems. For instance, the United States need to deal with governance issues, while China also has its own challenges. Who can better solve their domestic issues? If competition is to solve these questions, it can be referred to as positive competition. On the other hand, competition also has its negative aspects, such as in terms of geopolitics. Currently, there are many discussions about a new Cold War, especially concerning China-U.S. relations. Throughout human history, the most tragic and difficult times have been the Cold War, World War I, and World War II. If we move to that direction, the outcome of zero-sum games or competition could result in significant resource depletion, a consequence that no country want to see. So if I could ask very, very briefly, and you can only give one word for the last question, which would be the word that you think we can make this year? a better year than at least now. Mr. Ni, one word to wrap it up. Understanding. That's very important. Understanding, thank you. The ceasefire okay, in the Middle good. East and in Ukraine. Okay, thank you, please. I will use one word, and it is my hope that word is peace. Peace, that will be the goal. Hopefully that will be also the mean. One word, but I would repeat it three times. Trust, trust, trust. Trust. Thank you so much. Thank you for your trust in participating in this discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And this is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. China and the developing world, are they being seen through filters by others? How much is there wrong stereotypes and misinformation about China and the developing world? Here are some excerpts of the panel discussion focusing on what some call filters. The panel guests are Wang An, the executive director of CRRC. Ian Phillips, the Director of News and Media Division and Department of Global Communications at the United Nations. Yang Hui Lin, the former Vice President of Renmin University of China. Manuel Menendez III, the founder and CEO of MCM Group Holdings. And Chang Zhongyi, the Vice Chairman of the China Chamber of Commerce to the EU. So 
I want to start by asking very briefly, can you think about your experiences with the so-called filters? 我们中车的这个主要产品啊,主要是造,现在我们大家比较知道就是高铁复兴号,造高铁动车的。our company's major work is high-speed rail manufacturing, like building the Fuxing bullet train. Now I am going to share a story with you. China's mainland and Taiwan are relatively close, while there are still some problems of the filter within one country. Last year, a famous official in Taiwan said our high-speed rail has no backrest. He said at that time, Mr. Ma Yingju visited Guangzhou, we installed a backrest for him, but ordinary people have no backrest to take the high-speed rail. Of course, people in Chinese mainland heard that and thought it's ridiculous. But some people in Taiwan really believe there is no backrest in bullet trains because of the reports. That's an inaccurate media story I've encountered, which spread through a filter. I still hope that the media can be objective, fair and truthful with information, so that we can have a better understanding of the real situation in different parts of the world. Go to you, Mr. Phillips. I, I don't think it's a filter. I, I would dis because filter to me implies an intention. Uh, in my eyes, there is something called unconscious bias. Unconscious bias, something that you don't know you're doing that you do. And everybody has it. We have it in this room. People have it all around the world. And you're conditioned when you grow up in the society you live in, you hear things, you absorb things, and that conditions the way you see things. And the best news organizations, and I think it's important today to focus on media literacy and understanding who are the fact-based news organizations and who are not, the best of them always challenge assumptions. We had editors in place that would uh, work on standards that would make sure that reporting was balanced and accurate. We weren't perfect, nobody is perfect, but you have to have that healthy discussion to challenge stereotypes. And there are stereotypes, there's no question. You know, I, I'll give you one anecdote. Uh, I came from Shanghai, uh, where I've had some fascinating meetings with media organizations and uh, journalism students, and I immediately saw a story. I immediately saw a story and it was how many electric vehicles were on the streets of Shanghai. I couldn't believe it. I was so curious about it. My, I've dri driven my colleagues crazy. I've been talking about it all week. I started to Google to see how that story was being covered and there was a negative tone in some parts of the world. I won't mention which, but you know, this phenomenon which should be celebrated was being reported by some, not all, as a threat to their economies. And that made me think, how depressing. You know, so a, a good climate story, a good environmental story should be reported for what it is, which is a success story. But it's happening all over the world, okay? So I do believe that the best antidote to what you would call a filter, what I would call disinformation, is allowing journalists to prosper, allowing access, Obviously, I can tell from the answers that also bring us the reality you just mentioned, that we are coming from very different uh, circumstances. So people have very different views, even about whether there is a future or not, what shall we call it, and uh, what is the nature of it. Let me go to uh, Mr. Yang. Uh, a real world without filters is a very strong state. I can tell an illusion. I think a real world without filters is a very ideal state. But in a global sense, a state that is too ideal does not exist. So can there be a real world without filters? Actually, this can be questioned. But what is a filter is very important. I think there are positives and negatives about filters. The most important thing is that we need a deep conversation of ideas, I feel particularly appreciated that we have this discussion, since it's what the world really needs. What we say about what the world is and what China is can actually be constantly interpreted through different filters. For example, one French historian's famous saying is, 
there's no French history, but only European history. Then he went on to say, actually, there is no European history, only word history. Similarly, the Chinese scholar Liang Qichao said that ancient China was China in China, medieval China was China in Asia, and modern China was China in the whole world. President Xi Jinping also said China today is more than a country itself. It is very much a part of Asia and the world. I think that is a different filter. We have different understanding of the world and ourselves, and that is why both the positive and negative aspects of the filter need to be discussed. Let's go to you, Manny. Um, I got to know you because you were the one who established the first China-U.S. joint venture back in the 1980s. I know China then, so different from now, and China-U.S. then, so different from China-U.S. now, but I really want to know your anecdotes regarding the so-called filters with maybe a sense of history and a sense of personal anecdotes. Please, Amani. We are in a communication vehicle right now, so I think it's very important that we have frank and candid discussions. <clears throat> when I came to China, before I answer that, before I, when I first came to China, I have always found China, uh, based on the Confucius ph uh, philosophy, when people come from afar, you should welcome them and be happy. That's always been the case in China. <clears throat> I think if you look at the China in the beginning in 1980, uh, maybe the per capita income is $150 per person. Now it's 15000 approximately. So I've seen in my lifetime the rise of China, and it's not been good, it's not been great, it's been a miracle because of the scale. The scale of China taking 500 million people out of poverty, these are fantastic things. The improvement of life in China, across China, has been fantastic. When President Xi talks about common prosperity, that doesn't mean that uh, the journey is finished, it's only the beginning. So from my perspective, I think I don't look at this communication as a filter, I look at the communications of today as a weapon. And it's been used as a weapon uh, for certain countries to try to diminish China, uh, diminish them in a way which is in many cases unfair and unfounded. <clears throat> And I say that from the perspective of being on the ground in China. So seeing China, there's a lot of uh, media right now in the West uh, that is not fair to China. And the confidence in U.S. citizens, where it used to be very high about China relations with, Ch with U.S. and China, is now at an all-time low because the media just keeps hammering and hammering and hammering at China. And I think that it's unfair. So I think what we have to do and what's missing is what I call the trade defi a trust deficit. There's a huge trust issue between countries and China. And the only way I know from a common sense perspective to fix that is you have to have more people-to-people -people contact and at a higher frequency, not just come for you know, a quick meeting and a high-level meeting, but we have to not only get into the issues that are common issues, climate change and many that have been mentioned, but also into the thorny issues to understand with clarity what those thorny issues are so that there's no misunderstanding. And I think today in the world, if you look at surveys, I think the world does not like uncertainty. Certain the business community doesn't. And I think we're right now in a world, when you look across the globe, of a world of uncertainty, and no one likes that. Yeah. And communications will help fix that if we can find the right platforms to do that. Right. Let me also uh, bring in Mr. Chen uh, to tell his story. Last month, a TV station in one country where our projects is located and sent me an email with a few questions for me to answer. One of the questions was, your company, China Three Gorges Corporation, is what the U.S. calls a military-related enterprise. Can you answer for us why you are a military-related company? What have you done? Another question is that you have registered so many companies in many places, what is your purpose? They asked a lot of questions with a lot of unfriendliness and provocation. 
We didn't answer all of them. Two weeks later, the TV station made up and broadcast their own story about our projects, as well as what role they perceived China's central enterprises to be. They didn't stand on the basis of respect and communication at all. I don't think we can talk without trust. So actually, we are having a deficit of trust, as all of you know. So where should we start? And also, one of the most important thing is how should we find the root cause of uh, the so-called filters, or other words, uh, uh, conscious bias or unconscious bias or misunderstanding, and the list goes on. It's really complicated. I, I, it I, is. Yeah, it's it's hard to sum up in one word, but. There is so much polarization now. I wonder whether it's not beginning to expand and get bigger, and viewpoints are getting harder about different countries. There's more antagonism, and I think that feeds a dialogue that is perhaps surfacing in some of the journalistic coverage of the world. Mm. I think that's that's the worry here. I I believe in what others have said today about greater collaboration, greater cooperation, travel. You know, I've traveled around the world. I've interviewed world leaders from Belarus to Syria to Venezuela. And it's important to hear everyone's perspective on things and tr to try and inform yourself as well. Right. And it's wherever you travel, whether you're a journalist or not, you change your mind in even small degrees, you learn. And so I think there needs to be more of an exchange between journalists, but also between cultures to better understand the realities on the ground. Mm. And we're not really there. Uh, we need an internet where there is less disinformation. We're not there. I think mm. one will emerge, but I don't think we can simplify why some countries feel their message is getting distorted. A lot of countries do. It's easy to complicate simple issues sometimes, but that's okay. I think the worst thing is to make a complex issue shallow. For example, there are a lot of issues that cannot be discussed from a superficial level, like shared prosperity. What is shared prosperity? Different places translate it completely differently, and I see it is translated well here now, shared prosperity, and the key word in it is share. So I think that if we understand a concept differently, the conversation actually can be fundamentally misplaced, and what we are discussing about a world without filter is an ideal condition. I just said that the ideal condition is impossible in the sense of the whole world. I have to add that the work of academics is to make the impossible possible, to find the possibility in the impossibility, and this is what I particularly like. Searching for the possibility in the impossibility, it is very interesting. Searching for the possibility in the impossibility, this is a very interesting thing. From the business point of view, I think why there is filter may have two major causes. One is that there may be more or less political factors in it. Filter may have two major causes. One is that there may be more or less political factors in it. Behind the filter is competition, including competition between countries, competition among enterprises. Then, in order to win the competition, some people take the measures that they deem necessary, deliberately distorting the facts. More than anything else, the cause may be the huge difference in perception. In the whole world, the stages of development are different. The environment of development is different. The customs and tradition of people are different, leading to differences in perception. Sometimes we think it should be solved in this way, but others think it may be wrong. So media reports may focus on the preferred angle. I think that's problematic, and those media outlets can only capture a small part of what's going on. Like our company is an international company. To strip away these filters, we try as much as possible to strengthen communication locally, to spread the culture of our enterprise and spirit of Chinese culture, with the aim of enabling a better understanding of each other, and to reflect the fact as objectively and fairly as possible. For our enterprise, especially an international enterprise, it should be work under international rules. Now there are a lot of people who don't play by the rules, causing a lot of difficulties. 
Our enterprises still need to comply with market rules to create a good business atmosphere. If someone doesn't do things according to the rules, there is an old Chinese saying that it hurts 1,000 enemies and self-harm 800. In recent years, ESG or environmental, social and governance has become popular internationally, which is a platform for companies in different countries to work together. ESG exists everywhere. And I think it is exactly a process for enterprises to become formalized. We have to build our enterprises according to this. And I think we still need to strengthen communication. International enterprises like us should respect the local customs and, at the same time, telling the enterprise's own story. I think you have to look from the perspective of countries. Countries, all countries will put their own interests first. So let's look at one of the root realities. And then those countries who put their interests first have to balance then how to work with other countries. So if there's an industry, like we've seen and Ian just applied, uh, implied uh, with EV, China is by far the best in EV in terms of volume like BYD. Uh, and when you listen to the rhetoric in the media, the rhetoric in the media is that, oh, there's overcapacity or unfair subsidies or so forth. But the, if you took away all the, I'm talking from a business perspective now, if you took away all the subsidies and put a Chinese production line in China and a, a same production line in the US, the costs in China are different. They will be lower. Forget the subsidies. So, so the models are different. You cannot say, well, this is because China is cheating, because all countries give subsi uh, subsidies to priority industries. We do it, and other countries do it. So one of the root causes is that countries have to balance putting their own country's priorities and industries and balance it with working with other countries and allowing imports coming in. The second part is on communication. I think that if you look at the world economy, US and China represents in round numbers 45% of the world economy. We have to work together. We have to get it right, not only for our countries, but for the world, because that's the driving force in the world. And to do that, to do that, we have to find a path forward, again, more meetings, more face-to-face -face meetings, better understanding, and the only way to do that is, is to come together. And the last thing I want to say about communication, the problem of the trust deficit I made earlier is when China communicates in other countries, there's a lack of trust in that communication. Certain issues can be a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, toned down or tone deaf, and I think that will be helpful to China moving forward in communications with mm. the world. So with that, gentlemen, I think we wrap up this uh, second round of discussion. Thank you so much for your input. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight. Check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on X and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now and have a great weekend.